Good evening. I want to welcome everybody to our first in-person Audubon program, uh, regular, regular scheduled program for a very long time, so since the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, it's good to be back together with you uh, in this place, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Duluth. We're thankful for them uh, for allowing us to be here for our programs this year. Um, we'll start with a couple announcements, as you might know, and some of you have already been on them. On uh, Tuesdays in September, we've been having fall warbler walks when they're not rained out, mm -hmm. which is what happened this week down at Park Point. So if you're available at 7 a.m. Uh, this next Tuesday, you can meet Clinton and Christina down there. Uh, for a walk about the beach house area and the fields and all the for migrants. Um, we also have, uh, just to stay on the lookout for, uh, late October, early November, we like to do a North Shore trip. I think we're going to rename it from North Shore Sea Duck trip to just North Shore trip because we tend to see more final peplas lately <laughs> than we do <laughs> sea ducks, it seems like. So, uh, so be on the lookout for that. And then also, on Sundays in November, uh, Clinton and Christina go down to the Superior Entry for a goal watch as well, so look out for some announcements for a goal watch. Uh, we'll start the way that we always like to do, if there's any observations of anything you've been seeing recently. Um, in my neighborhood in Lakeside, I still have at least three hummingbirds coming daily. This is the latest I've ever had in the 42 years we've lived in our house, had so many this late in September. Usually by mid-September, you get a, you know, get a young bird who hatched like passing through. So um, I don't know if they nested late because I had my last adult male on August 23rd, which is later than usual too. But they must have either nested an extra time or um, we're late. <laughs> we do have a lot of hummingbirds as well. Oh. And uh, juvenile beef water. Rose the girls who go to the thrashers. We've still got our thrashers too. Oh, wow. Your what? Brown thrashers. Oh, yeah, I'm I have them. They're in yard this year. I'm a cat. Anything else you all can see? I was so delighted to see a hawk moth in my garden, and I was sitting in a chair right next to the where the flowers were, and a vireo, and I haven't yet looked up which vireo it was, came flying in with a very determined look on its face and grabbed the hawk moth. <laughs> and right about eight feet from my face, <laughs> it was pretty startling. <laughs> and the hawk moth got away, and they both flew away, and I don't know what happened after that. I saw the weirdest thing that I've seen in years. Um, the middle of last month, my sister was visiting from Florida, so I'm showing her all the sights, driving up the shore, and we stopped at the lighthouse in Two Harbors. And we're just looking around, um, looking at birds, looking at the, the lighthouse, and we saw this gull swoop down to a juneberry bush that was eating juneberries <laughs> on the wind. I've never seen that before. I've seen the Watson June Berries down on the way, but that's the first time I've ever seen that. That's crazy. Tried to get a video, but couldn't get it in my viewfinder. Yeah, go ahead, Lauren. Does anyone know where in Lakeside the pileated woodpeckers actually nested? My male, who Frank banded three years ago so I can recognize him, had raised at least four babies and he was bringing them to my yard after they were fledged. And he was, uh, the first one I saw was on July 10th and he was still feeding a different baby, a male, last Saturday, the 10th. So it was feeding fledglings for two months. It was pretty amazing. But they come to my yard so often, and I have no idea where they nested. Nobody has an answer. I don't know where they nested, but I can tell you one of those young males is in my yard. And we don't live very far from you. We're only about four or five blocks from you. So I'm assuming it might be one of these males. Oh, probably. Yeah. And he was banging in my house the other day, so I had to shoot him off. And he did wear the suit, so I was happy. 
Yeah, go ahead. Well, I live at 34 Avenue East and 2nd Street and have honeyated woodpeckers routinely. And this year, my goodness, I think I may have two pairs, but I'm not sure. And, and babes, long ago now, they're middle size or whatever now. I just can't stay and watch them all the time, but I wish you the Lord had been here many times this summer and still. But anyway, they're, and they, I'm sh sure as can be, they nest in the ravine that becomes Bent Creek when it goes through Glen Sheen. It's in a creek, a valley between 34th and 35th Avenue East, and it goes up into uh, Hidden Valley above 4th Street. So there, woodpeckers. I haven't seen my red belly for maybe six weeks or so, but a pair of red belly woodpeckers also. So no flamingos or spoonbills today. <laughs> That's what I was looking for. That one still hanging out on Park Pike that flamingo. That flamingo. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's still there. <laughs> on the right is a red belly. Yeah, that's what you said. <laughs> <laughs> Any other final sightings, observations, things you've been noticing lately? Are there any announcements that I am neglecting at all? All right, a little frazzle of technology here this evening. Yeah, Hockridge this weekend, right? Well, in any case, uh, before we get going with the program, just to note that um, there's some tables that are over there that we moved out of the way. If uh, you'll be so kind to help out in putting the tables back kind of in this orientation as these two tables are, uh, and getting six chairs back around, that would be very helpful. With all that said, uh, we are delighted tonight to be back in person and to welcome Scott Wolf to be with us to share a bit about seabird conservation and research on Midway Island. So, exotic. Thank you for being with us. That's a delight. Thanks so much for the control, Jeff. Um, so I, every time this happens, I don't have a lot of experience melding computer to projector, so we have a few fits and starts, but um, we'll see if this is working well. What if I just do it? It's up the top one. There we go. I blocked it. And our cord is short. Um, The, um, so I'm going to have to manually move this, so i got to be right next to it. I'm sorry if I'm in your way. Um, a few things, so I was, I was I'm, first of all, thank you so much just, just for having me. It's a, it's a delight to share this experience. It is so hard to get the midway out of it. Um, it's almost impossible. I was there in 2007-2008 on an albatross census. Um, one of my dear friends works at the Fish and Wildlife Service, she's a seabird authority. Um, she's in charge of all the protected U.S. lands of the remote Pacific Islands, something like that, but job title. Um, so she's a, she's a wonderful friend and it really it comes in handy at times. So, they had, so there's a project on Midway Island um, the, in 1990s, so rats and mice got on the island during World War II. Rats um, were really hard on the uh, bone and petrels. They nested burrows and the rats were out on field day. They successfully eradicated the rats in 97. Also there were some mice, the mice took a hit, but with the rats gone and the mice have done very well without any competition. And then around in 2000, early 2000 teens, um, some of the volunteers noted there were some albatross uh, adults on their nest with sores on the back of their neck and their back ulcerated and they die. And they really didn't know what was causing it. They sold, um, they sent some photos of the wounds to a, a veterinarian, USGS veterinarian on, in Honolulu. He's the only guy in the Pacific. Uh, Terry Work, I got to work with this guy who was phenomenal to work with. Um, and he said, yeah, I got a rodent problem. He's worked all over the Pacific and he recognized the wounds. So they put a um, light or a, um, camera on, on some bird nests, and sure enough, at night, they'd see the mice crawling on the back of the birds. 
eat into their neck and back, which is hard for the albatross. They're so loyal, they just, they'll, they'll stay on their egg no matter what, and, um, and you know, they can't, you can't turn your head around to get a mouse off because there's a mouse there. And they don't eat mice, you know, they eat squid. So, um, it's a, obviously an invasive species and it's a problem. So they hatched this plan um, uh, to uh, essentially poison the island. Um, and this has been done successfully on other islands. The South Georgia Island had ruins and they killed all of them. It's been done successfully on a number of islands. The um, Midway has a lot of military infrastructure. Um, it makes it a bit more complicated. So they spread poison uh, via helicopter and ground in July and August when most of the birds had left, with the non-target species. And I was, um, they, they picked me up to be part of the duck team, the lace and duck um, is there, it's an endangered species, there's about 1,600 of them on the planet, a thousand of which, a thousand of which are on Midway Island and the other 600 between a couple other islands in the Hawaiian chain. Um, so that's why I was there. So I'd work, you know, 40 plus hours a week, and usually, but not always, we'd have like half a weekend off. They worked us pretty hard, but a lot of times morning and evening, you know, when the light is nice, you have some time. Um, but it's a wonderful experience. Um, sadly, it's, uh, there's still mice in several locations. So it has failed. Um, and they're shifting now to a strategy of mitigation another research and uh, you know how they can get at these mice and I and that is unfolding as we speak that they just made that announcement about two weeks ago they asked me to not share some things <laughs> because this was a little controversial project not everybody was behind it um, and I, I don't know if that gag order has been lifted on me yet so there's a few slides that I won't show you it's just you know catching ducks and that kind of stuff it's nothing dramatic but, um, so with that, uh, so it's, so Midway Atoll is a national wildlife refuge. It was transferred to the military and the Fish and Wildlife Service in the late 1900s, early 2000s. Um, there is a sign above there, Midway Atoll National Wildlife Refuge, and then remnants of the military base in the middle, obviously. Um, so these are the birds of Midway. Uh, the ones in green are the ones that nest on Midway Island. It's not white complete, the white turn also the nests on midway. Um, did I go off focus? Are you okay? Um, I might get you know, I might get some of these names wrong as I go through them, so forgive me. It's a little intimidating to be in front of a group of birders who are much better than I am. So the rock stars of the island are the albatrosses. This is the lace sand albatross. Next was Hoodie Turn, was, which is one of the smaller native birds on the islands. Um, it's the albatrosses that are it is so, you quickly become smitten by these birds. They um, are just gorgeous, what can you say? Um, the, um, but you have to be careful. Oh wait, here it is. Albatross reproduction success, um, a, a gentle downward trend since early 2000s. No one's sure why, no one is sure if this is real or just natural fluctuation. <coughs> hypotheses include it being um, related to warming sea temperatures, decreased availability of food, uh, non-native uh, means of attrition, so long line fishing, mice. And so this is in part was the impetus behind trying to kill the mice. The yellow is the black-footed albatross, and the purple are the lace and albatross. We'll get to more of those later. This is the only picture of a mouse I have. It's a dead one. Um, we did bait the piers where there's a, two islands. I'll show you that in, in a minute. Um, we go between the islands and the pier on Midway. We bait kind of for, for biosecurity. Every time we get on a boat, we go through all our packs and gear, make sure there wasn't any mice on it. But we did catch one mouse on the pier, and it was a reminder that this is the real deal. Um, so this is the guy I was working with. This is a lay sand duck. Um, this is an unusual one, and that was late. In my, I was there for about six weeks. This was 
uh, week four, and I found a duck that hadn't been banded yet. Um, again, there's about 1,600 of these on the island. Uh, mostly, originally, through all the islands when the Polynesians came, there were lace end ducks on the main islands, you know, the Kapka Chains, Maui, uh -oh, Oahu, etc. Uh, they went with the arrival of Polynesians. Um, the main group was on Lake Sand Island, and then in about uh, 2004, they introduced some to Midway Island to expand the population base, and it was very successful. Um, so these are the two islands. So the island on on the east or the left or the west is Sand Island, which is where much of the current infrastructure is, and where the mice are. And, and Eastern Island um, is rodent free. And it's about a mile, mile and a half across this channel. We go across about every other day or so. Um, these airstrips are remnants from World War II. This was the site of a major military battle. Um, Gobble Midway and changed the course of World War II, very pivotal in world history. Um, the, um, the main infrastructure is here. At one point, they're in the height of the military years, infrastructure was designed to handle 5,000 people. Um, this, is a, this is one of the lace end ducks. Um, they're about the size of a teal, but they're more closely related to mallards. Uh, this is a lace sand and a gray tail. I think that's right. This is where I get nervous. Gray tail is a tattler. Um, it's not a wandering, but it's, there's two of them. Um, I think there's just some of the, the duck. I included this photo. This is the only photo I have of a lace and duck in flight. They tend not to fly very much. Um, the, uh, but it gives you an idea of the density of the birds and also some of the military infrastructure. This is a air base uh, structure, probably dating back to Vietnam days. Those are all lace and albatrosses. There's their babies up in front there, little brown, dark, fuzzy things. Oh, those are chicks. We'll get to those, yeah. So the time I was there before, they were just on nests on eggs, and this time I got to see the chicks, which was a blast. Oh, they nest on They nest on both. Yeah, they're all over both islands. Very heavy. So this is on Eastern Island. Again, we go over there every other day. Uh, we're moving the birds from sand to Eastern, and we um, Check, make sure they had enough water and food. Um, very labor intensive. It was interesting as we adjusted our technique as times went along, because it's just not enough labor, not enough people to, to do the original plan. And it was, um, you know, the sun is very intense. It's, uh, it sounds tropical and inviting and kind of is. But, but the sun is really brutal. Um, this is me uh, cleaning out this what's called a guzzler. It's a sweet, we pump in water for the ducks to drink and swim. And ducks, as you know, are messy. And this one is mostly clean, but I just wanted to get a shot of myself in action, <laughs> dealing with. Um, I called myself a, an EDS. It's a endangered duck poop technician. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're just working on some shade cloth here. Um, we had a little shed there, and we, that's where we keep our supplies. All the transportation on the islands mostly is by bicycle or foot. Uh, a few golf carts that had to move heavier equipment. And this is a, a female with, uh, you can see some chicks in behind her. That was on Eastern Island. Uh, she was, I mean, they were breeding on Eastern Island and hatching chicks. That was really good to see. Um, down here you can see a brood, a brood of ducklings outside one of our guzzlers on the ramp and lace and albatross and chicks all over the place. Uh, again, the brood of ducklings are so stinking cute. Uh, this is super mom, we, that's what we call her. She had, at one time I counted, she had 32 or 36 ducklings with her of varying ages. Really interesting, she would, um, I don't know why these ducklings would go to her, maybe she was more aggressive defending her water source or something, we don't know. But it was really cool to watch. And there she is again, super mom. 
um, a bunch of ducklings around there. There is a pod, there would be a pod of spinner dolphins in the lagoon, or um, in the atoll periodically, and every now and then moving to and from the island, they'd, they'd come in and follow us as well. So. A couple of other staff and volunteers I've worked with, we did the math, I was the oldest guy on the island. <laughs> This is, uh, this is a building I lived, the house I lived in, uh, with the gatekeepers always present. Uh, native, non, native mammalian species, I think the only one is the monk seal. This is, this is they're endangered. This is an adult in territory in the North Beach of the Sand Island. Um, he patrol of that. Um, and this is a, a what they call a weaner, a recently weaned pup. Um, the biology of these animals is fascinating. Um, they're really good about protecting the animals. There's only a few beaches, small beaches that are open to people, the rest are closed to people, because it's for the animals. That's really encouraging. And this one, I was up in the vegetation, I have a 400 millimeter lens and I got this shot of this <laughs> Um, this is a, um, a grayback tern. Um, Eastern Island had a lot of um, spitty turns and grayback turns. That's incredibly loud. This is part of the infrastructure. Um, you can see the bowling alley in the background, and they have a little kind of a memorial to the military presence battle midway there. It's very tastefully done. Um, and the history is all over the place. Uh, the streets are all gravel streets, but they have names as Nimitz Street or Avenue. And Admiral Nimitz was a Pacific Fleet or World War II. And this building, this great building in the back, um, so when I was there like 15 years ago, you could get access in here, it's still open, you could be up on the roof. If anybody has seen the historic footage of the Battle of Midway, John Ford was a Hollywood photographer, film producer. And he got there because the U.S. knew that, that Japan was coming. Um, they had a warning, a heads up with an attack. He was ready and he filmed planes coming in over the western tip of Midway Island and, and the bombing. And he was taking that from the top of this building. Uh, that building is now, it's, it's now condemned. A lot of the old buildings and infrastructure are crumbling. It also gives you an idea of the bird density. Uh, this is the original seaplane hangar. It's falling apart. They're gradually taking it apart. They're gradually removing a lot of buildings um, outside of the seaplane hangar. A uh, hangar, little, little patch of grass and the albatross that they use it. A lot of refuse, a lot of um, garbage from you know buildings being taken down. Uh, that's an old landing craft from the war days. Does a lot it stay of there, the well, slowly it's hoping to get it off. It's, I mean, it's on the middle of the Pacific Ocean, so they're hoping to barge it out. Like, so this pile of plastic that people, volunteers, and staff like myself have been, you know, they take a Sunday afternoon and we're going to clean up this part of the beach. There's always this plastic coming shore. It's very sad. Um, you think Park Point Beach is bad? Man. So we would clean up part of the beach, spend four hours doing that, and we'd kind of make a party out of it. And we'd bring it here, and then hopefully someday, um, so they get some supplies and be a barge, and when the barges leave, I, I assume they're taking out some of this trash, but I'm not sure. I just don't have that experience or knowledge. Great place for uh, new shoes if you can find a pair that match. Um, some other birds on the island is a. Uh, uh, Red-footed booby, uh, uh, brown booby. There's a mass booby. I only saw one. I didn't include that photo here. Other guys saw more. And, you know, they were nesting on the Eastern Island. A white tern used to be called a fairy tern. I like the old name better because they look like fairies. They just flutter in and right up to you to check you out. They are these gorgeous little creatures. Uh, both black and brown uh, noddies nesting on the island. They're really wonderful. And then ruddy turnstiles, we all know them because we get them here. I just love these birds. Um, 
This is a flock where he turns stones. All the birds flying away are turn stones on Eastern Island. There'll be some big flocks, usually 60 and sometimes up to two to 300. But the flask colors when they fly are mm -hmm. spectacular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, tropic birds, red-tailed and white-tailed tropic birds, a lot of red-tailed. I only saw one white-tailed, but there's a few more in the air. I saw two in here. Did, did you ever see one of those turn red? But they get angry, they flush. Their whole body flushes. Didn't hear about that, not heard about that. I was stationed there for a year. On Midway? Yeah. Really? Cool deal. When did you get I was a Navy medic. In what year? 68.9. Wow. Cool. Um, yeah, you can watch these guys fly all day. They're one of the few birds that can fly backwards. And a courtship, you know, they'd be flying them, they'd, they'd be flying this way and they'd do these backwards ovals. Their courtship flights. Uh, Pacific Golden Plover, they have their own fan club in the Hawaiian Island area. They um, are very common there during migration. We have flocks of about 600 at one point. Uh, white tailed tropic bird. And a uh, sooty turn. This is bristle thigh curlew. They're fairly common there. Um, they, uh, they will eat albatross eggs. Um, but they're hard to photograph. I just didn't. I just never got around to getting a good photo of one. Um, there's a wedge-tailed shearwater. These birds are. Um, they come in during the day and they're out flying around at night and they have this really guttural noise. I have a recording of it, but I don't have it here for us. But they're pretty weird. And this is a chick of a bone and spectral. I don't have a photo of an adult bone. They're mostly nocturnal. They'll come in at night, um, and there's probably half a million there now. After they got rid of the rats, the one of the petrels have just really exploded. It's wonderful. You, um, it's hard walking. Um, you try to avoid where there's a lot of petrol nests because there's burrows and you break through. You have to make sure the burrow's clean, and if there's a chicken there, you got to make sure it's got a way out, etc. Another Pacific Golden Clover. Um, one of the non-native birds, um, is the yellow canary and they were introduced around early 1900s. This was the place where the final connection was made for the Trans-Pacific Cable. Um, and there was a pair of canaries coming over with one of the staff or family working with the cable company. And they um, have done pretty well and it'd be a, until recently actually. There may not be a, there may not be any more. Um, and that wasn't a great loss for the fish and wildlife people because they're trying to uh, kind of res restore them, you know, restore it to its native state. I was told uh, canaries are gone, which is okay in a way, but I did think it would be a uh, very interesting study of genetics over the last 220 years, all those birds just from, you know, from, uh, from the original two birds. And they had weird blotches of color also other places in their body. This is another non-native bird. Um, this flew in during one night. Uh, this is a C-17 uh, air transport, U.S. Air Force. So the, they still have Eastern Island to maintain the landing strip, in part for uh, plan, uh, planes on Trans-Pacific routes that have trouble for one reason or another. This plane had trouble when um, the airspace it wanted to fly through was suddenly closed down because one of Elon Musk's rockets was coming back in. So they closed this big chunk of airspace, so this plane had to, to divert and it didn't have enough fuel to make its original, the fuel it had for its original path, it didn't have enough to do this because it got moved out of the way. So they landed here to refuel. Um, they sucked in about 10 petrels on the landing. Um, so they had to wait to get through some special equipment to make sure their engines were clean. Um, but we got to interact with the staff. I was really impressed. They're very professional. They're all about 12 years old. Um, <laughs> incredibly sharp. Um, the, the 
commander was a woman, probably in her upper 30s, low 40s, just on top of her stuff. Um, and they, they gave us a tour in the back of this plane with a big boat, a big military boat. All the fish and wildlife people were drooling after because they loved that boat that nice. Um, but landing on that island is a real threat to the birds. Absolutely. They can only land at night. Um, planes only land and take off in the dark. Is inside the, the, the plane for $330 million. You can have one. One of the delightful visitants, this is the first time ever in anywhere in the, in the Hawaiian chain. This was a uh, northern lapwing. Um, North America, they're mostly just on the northeast coast, kind of kind of Canadian seaboards, seabirds, Canadian coast. Um, and, you know, Maine, that area, I, I don't have any experience with those. The rest of you may have seen them there. And there was a reported one in Michigan two years ago. But, so he was a delight. It, and this bird hung along for I get up early in the morning and lay on my belly and crawl through the mud. Um, it was just really a treat. This is another bone and petrol chick. I'd show you where his nest was, but I wasn't supposed to be in this building. <laughs> it was the old generator building. It was off of it. And the magnificent frigate birds on the eastern island, they would court and nest. This is a Christmas shearwater. It's a pretty uncommon bird. There's just a few of them in that area. Um, this is the only one I saw. The, um, not much is known about this bird because they spend most of their time out somewhere in the ocean. Nobody knows where. Same is true of the petrels. Very little is known about the bone and petrels. And these are back to the rock stars. This is one of my numerous camera assistants. Oh shoot, there is a video. I didn't play or I missed it. I was, uh, I was going to tell you, you have to be careful with these birds because they'll, they'll, um, they're prone to these unprovoked attacks and I have one come up and he just grabs my pant legs, thrashing it all over, but they're, they're really curious birds. That must hurt when he pinches you. I'm sorry? That must hurt when he pinches you. Yeah, yeah, I think at first really gentle and then every now and then, uh, I, I was wearing sandals here, I quickly learned not to wear sandals. <laughs> they're, they're, they like the toes. Um, this is a black, black footed albatross. Last census, well, there's about 590 some thousand lay sand nests and about 30,000 black footed nests. But these black footed islands are just, well, they're all enchanting. Um, the birds, when I was there, the ones that are doing their courtship dances, they're all like teenagers trying to learn to dance. All the adults that are successfully nesting are um, busy feeding their chick. They come in and regurgitate some slime from, you know, uh, flying fish eggs and, and squid, and then they go back out for another load. Um, so this, these are some of the, um, I call them teenagers that are trying to get the dance to them. I don't, um, I have videos too that I hope I'll get alerted to when they, when I get to them. This is really cool, these two birds. This is a short-tailed albatross. Um, these birds were pushed almost to the brink of extinction. They were pushed to the brink of extinction. Uh, I have enough, there's a couple of islands off the coast of Japan. The biggest one is Torishima, which had millions of short-tailed albatrosses. These birds are <coughs> half again as large as the lace sand albatross. And um, people in Japan who go to the island to club them for the feather bed trade, eggs, you know, albumin for photographic plates. Late 1800s, early 1900s. The main harbor on Torishima was impacted by a volcanic eruption, making much, much less amenable to people, but also World War II. These birds were probably saved by World War II. 
all the Japanese were all fighting. 1947, 48, uh, guys were on Torishima on the far distant point. They saw a group, you know, a couple dozen white birds, and in short, they were with horses. Um, they're probably on the wing. They will spend their first five to nine years on the wing before they're ready to be and come back to me. Now the population is up to two to three thousand. The staff on Midway have worked hard to try to get breeding populations here just to have more, have more breeding populations. So they do have a pair of breeding. And this is the male, and this is last year's chick or young. Um, they did successfully fledge a chick this year. And it's really cordoned off. You really can't get, I mean, they're really good about keeping people out of there. Not there's just looking at like 48 people on the island. Um, but I said, you know, you, you know, it's just prevention from going too close because we don't want to scare them. But while I was, I was there with a the head biologist, uh, Jonathan Plissner, who was one of the best birders I've ever met. Uh, he, um, and we were just there you know, outside the Cardin Dove area. And Pops decided he was going to walk down to the beach and fly away, so he walked right by us, um, and allowing us these opportunities. But just a fantastic creature. <laughs> yeah, there it was wonderful. I mean, the lighting was really bad, but it's what I had to deal with. And then the morning and evening, I could just sit down by the water and watch these birds and see their um, uh, dynamic soaring. You know, they and other seabirds and gulls will take advantage of the wings to move over the water. Um, the tips of the wings sometimes will, will caress the surface of the ocean. Um, they are easily enchanting. Uh, this is called the wing tuck. These are, if this is a perspective, you hardly ever get a bird taking off towards you, so I just included this because you Aren't able to see it from this perspective. Um, when the Blackfooters walk, they walk like Groucho Marx. <laughs> <laughs> and when they do this part of the dance, often they're up on their tiptoes. It's just really cool. Showing up, I had to change how I did things here. I'll go back and try to find them. This is a chick, relatively early on. And I was there long enough to see them grow um, and start coming in. There's some of their adult feathers before I left. How long does it take them to? Fledge and be able to fly. How, how many they, they'll hatch in um, January, like mid January, and they'll fledge in the June, early July, so about six months. Wow. Um, this is one outside an old bunker from the war days. Any part in the story? So, this one is a sad, soggy chick during the he's getting rained on, but. Um, you can see some of his adult feathers coming on. Uh, as they get older, they start to exercise their flight muscles a bit. This is during a downpour. That's a chick. And they just stand there, and it's a fairly big chick. Um, this is just days before I had to leave. Uh, you can see some of his adult feathers, but he's almost not recognizable as a creature. Um, but he dries off, and I mean, I think. You know, he just stays still and all the rain gets off on his outer feathers and he's got a backdrop of some whale bones there. <laughs> this is one of my last photos with my phone. They will often sit back on their ankles with their web feet off the ground just for kind of temperature regulation. And I'm 
sorry these videos aren't popping up for me. I can go back and I'll just manually do it. So I told you all the garbage on the islands. Um, so one woman has figured out how to turn garbage into art. I'm blocking on her name right now, but she's made Susan Collins or something like that. She's made quite a name for herself. And these are um, cigarette lighters. The, um, yeah, the mo two most common items to wash up are bottle caps and cigarette lighters. And uh, when I was there before, they had a huge uh, cone, it's like six feet tall, big cone of chicken wire full of cigarette lighters. Just a, a I, I think that's where a lot of these lighters came from, was the collection. Um, but she's made quite a name for herself doing this, and uh, my friend on uh, Honolulu in uh, Nanawa who bought one of her reports and is sitting at her house now. This is a nighttime uh, shot just of the memorial area. And this is my last shot. I'm going to back out and um, try to pull those videos. Here we go. Any questions while I'm searching? Um, I flew from, I took the bus, I took the shuttle to Minneapolis and I flew to Honolulu and then I um, stayed with some friends overnight and the next day they have a, um, a private charter, the, the charter of the plane and they, we had to be there like at 5 o'clock and then, um, and the plane takes off in the dark. And it's a jet, but it's only took um, about three hours, which wasn't bad. When I was there before, it was about a five-hour flight, and it was probably one of the most uncomfortable flights I've ever had. Then have a headrest, blah, blah, blah. and because it's at night, we got so this this was pretty cushy, but you still still sleep disrupted. May I ask? Her, uh, Question, do you, do you know a uh, local bird authority in Boulder, Erickson? I do, yeah, look at it. She has talked about uh, uh, an albatross. I Wisdom. Think. Wisdom. Wisdom. Yeah. Yes. The oldest bird in the world. Well, the oldest known bird in the world. Oh, you, oh you're, you're here. here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't. So I have a picture of myself with Wisdom. I didn't include it in the show. I was show. just wondering if you, if you can tell us anything about it. Yeah, that. I do. I can. So Wisdom, when I was there in 07, 08, I, um, Got a picture of myself with wisdom. She's a snippy old lady. Um, and she showed up the last two years. She showed, showed up in November, but her roommate has not shown up for the last two years. So she's playing the singles game. Um, and um, I'm a little distracted, though, I'm trying to get back to the videos. Oh, Lord, she, you um, know how old she is now? So she, so Wisdom showed up last November. Uh, she was banned by um, Chandler Robbins. Yeah, Chandler Watt Robbins in like 54. 56. 56. That's right. I was a year old. That's right. She's, um, she must be about 72 now. Wow. Um, yeah, she's at least 72 uh, because she's right. Uh, is she, if she hatched at the beginning of their season, that was before I was born, so she's one year older than me. <laughs> yeah, we're born, we were born the same year. No, no. I was born in 51, but she, uh, they, oh, they, right, right. they believe yeah. she was at least five years old when he banned yeah. her because uh, she was an adult on her nuts, and it takes five years to become yeah. uh, adults. Yeah, she was, banned the, she was banned a year after I was born, was so she's about four years older than I am. And he, uh, he's the one in the 90s who wondered, he went back there and wondered if any of the birds that he'd originally banded or that they'd studied back then were still alive. And they were not using computers for the banding yeah. of old records. They were all still on cards. And those bands don't last long. 
because the birds spend all year out on salt water. And so uh, if they retrapped a bird that already had a band that the band was wearing, they would change it and make a new card, but it just had the new number and the old number. And she had gone through like five bands. And so he had to go look up this number and then go through all the card catalog looking up this number. And that's how he verified that she was yeah. there. The whole reason they started the banding project there was that they had decommissioned the island and were going to recommission it during the Korean War. And we're going to, for the first time, be flying jets. And the Army wanted to get rid of all of them, all the birds. Yep. And Chandler Robbins and a few other Fish and Wildlife Service guys said, uh, come on, how about if you let us study the birds, find out what substrates they don't like, and we can set it up so that they avoid the areas where planes are coming and going. And that was back when government agencies worked together. And so. Yeah, it's a great story. It was uh, some very forward thinking people and on both sides. There's some military mm -hmm. people willing yeah. to consider some alternatives. Uh, they still did kill a lot of birds. Yeah, but um, the, the military's main concern was to not be killing the pilots right. and not to be destroying the aircraft. And um, I mean, it, yeah, it was lethal, but killing all of them would have been. Yeah, and it easy. turns out if you only come in during the night, there's you know, obviously that problem because the albatrosses are not flying at night. The, um, we did, I, I, I have a zillion photos from this trip, and I, I didn't include a few of them, I didn't include a lot of them, but I didn't include the majority. But there's another little story we did ban. Um, Wisdom's Grand Chick this this year. So I have a little photo of that of the banding the banding procedures. This poor little guy. And I'm like, why are you all these people picking on me for? <laughs> is Wisdom an anomaly, or are there others that are like 40s, 50s, 60s? No, That's a great know. question. So there's a black-footed albatross in its 60s on the islands, and I mean Wisdom is the just the oldest one we know about. There could be birds older than her. Nobody knows who would have it. And nobody knows for sure how old she is. 72 is her minimum yeah. age. Yeah. So I was, I was listening. Well, I went to my friend in Honolulu, um, during Oahu. I always wait impatiently for, okay, is wisdom there? Is there, you know? And she's, our, she's um, people say like one bird doesn't matter, and in the population sense, you can make that ar argument. But she is a celebrity. And she attracts attention for all sorts of people. Well, and one bird like that can make a difference in terms of public awareness. Absolutely. Which is exactly Absolutely. What we need if we're going to preserve any birds. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's a wonder, too, for any living creature to survive for 72 years on their own without any, anybody else supporting them and to find enough to eat. And to feed. That's, pretty, that's pretty remarkable. Yeah, it is. None of us could do it. Keep yeah. reproducing. <laughs> yes. I'm like, of her. Is, does she become infertile or is she still fertile at this old age? Nobody like, knows. It's a great question. She laid an egg two years ago? Yeah, she hatched a chick three years ago. Yeah, or she fledged one. Yeah. Yeah. Did you say the um, albatross stayed airborne for five years? I'm sorry? Did you say the albatross stayed airborne for five years? Not, well, so as a, um, they can, like if I, uh, if I pull back up that map of the Pacific Ocean, these birds will fly north and they'll uh, forage off of the um, coast of Kamchatka, Aleutian Islands, north of the Aleutian Islands, um, up in the Bering Sea. They, uh, the black-footed albatrosses are more closer to coastal areas in North America. But they will be, um, they'll come in just to breed, and then they're gone. Um, if they don't breed successfully, they leave. If their chick dies, they leave. Um, they spend the rest of the time on the sea. They expend less energy flying than they do swimming on the water. When their wings open up, they've got like a jackknife, and they lock. And so they expend no energy to keep their wings there. And the dynamic soaring, you can see the gulls on the lake doing this. So they'll catch a, you know, they'll catch a wing, 
wind and they'll and they'll go up. They'll gain elevation. You know, they, they go downwind a little bit, but then they'll just dive down towards the surface um, and gain speed. Um, they can do that all day, all night. They, and the birds in the south, uh, in the southern hemisphere, the, you know, the roaring 40s, 40, 45th parallel, they just circle the globe. I don't know how many times they circle. And it's really interesting the GPS data. Uh, these, some of these birds are GPS tagged. There's a great book by Carl Safina called Eye of the Albatross, if anybody's interested. Um, it's a really good read of the biology in the Central Pacific Islands. Um, mostly albatrosses, but a lot of other birds and sea, you know, with turtles, uh, some of the tuna, uh, just amazing stuff, and the people involved. And uh, uh, some of the adaptations the fishermen have done, the commercial fisheries have done, to mitigate loss of albatrosses. Um, the North Americans are pretty receptive to it, trying to get the, the Koreans, uh, the Japanese, the Russians on board is a, is a harder sell. Um, here's one, um, remember these are teenagers. I don't know if the sound is gonna come through my computer or through here. It's probably my computer, I'll turn it up. Through my computer, so it's not very loud. It's ruining your group. But these are, I think of these are three teenagers at the high school dance, you know, <laughs> who's dancing with who. And you see how they walk like Groucho Marx? <laughs> Is one of my assistants coming in? I'm not an authority on them. The, um, there's a couple of maneuvers, repeated maneuvers. Um, I'll show you on a few of the others here. But these are all teenagers. This is not related to me. This is these just, are practicing. They're getting ready for next year, you know? You know, the big prom in the fall. And so these guys are still kind of clumsy. They, don't, they really don't know what they're doing there. Who do I dance with? Oh, Kind of stumbling around, it's kind of like myself dancing. Um, <laughs> the um, let me back out and I had to change how I did something because we had some projector issues. And, um, I'm just blaming it on technology rather than my feebleness. This is what it's all about. This is an adult coming in to, to feed her chick. I'm, I'm going to do that again and get the bar out of the way. Sure that work. So they regurgitate this oily s substance, you know, it's all squid, dissolved squid stuff. But look at that chick. He's just one bag of, of, of oil. <laughs> and, and you watch him waddle. They, they're just a, look like a big balloon full of oil <laughs> walking around. It's, it's incredibly high caloric stuff. Oh, this is one uh, unprovoked attack, a charge to attack with no provocation. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a friendly investigation. <laughs> yeah, look up here. I should.
this is the nipple. This is these are some of the links, and this is just right outside my where I live. These guys are getting pretty good. These are the goat pockets, that's a wing tuck. Sky move. <laughs> Do they know if they change mates or keep the same? They're mostly monogamous, unless they're made, one mate diamonds. Yeah, they have all that, they have the branding records and all that. It's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. This is it. This is the, um, so this is a pair of black, black footers who have their dance moves. They're getting pretty good at it. They're feeling lucky for next time. So they put their wings out and they clap their bills next to each other. Hmm? Very careful not to poke each other. They're incredibly delicate. They can be very tender with each other, just nibbling or caressing each other on the neck. Reminds me of my wedding dance. <laughs> Stretch would they do this? Five minutes, eight minutes. Those birds have four crops. Ah, no, that's just their breast muscles. Yeah, those are just flight muscles. display last. I'm sorry? How long does that courtship display last? You know, They'll do it all the time. Yeah. Um, once once the birds are on the nest, they'll they have this elaborate uh, kind of behavioral exchange of who's taking over the nest. You know, the, one bird will be incubating the egg for, for two weeks or three weeks. The mate will be on the seat and come back and then when it's time for the incoming bird to take over the incubation job, the, the bird that's been doing the incubation, something, I don't want to give this up yet. So they, they have this interesting little ritual of finally the one gets off and the other bird gets off and the other one goes off to feed. And then when they have their chicks, they can't leave the chick away alone very long between feedings, um, days. Um, and then the bird gets longer, they can be gone for a long period of time and they'll fly thousands of miles over the course of three, two to three weeks and come back with a lot of squid. Are you banning those chicks then? I'm sorry? Do you ban the chicks? Yeah, I didn't. Um, there, the, those uh, four younger folks were kind of, they, had, they do for any of those who are interested. Um, they do have, um, they hire four volunteers a year for a four month stint. I think they do it summer and the summer season and winter season. And they do a lot of the banding, that kind of thing. No, there are any theories on how they find their way back to Midway Island over and over and over when they're feeding chicks or when they're 
not breeding? I mean, I mean, uh, to, to find yeah. the island I, in the I, middle I, of the Pacific. That's one of the mysteries. That's one of the beautiful things. I mean, how do they do that? They <laughs> say, hey, Siri. <laughs> and, 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 yeah. I know they don't have GPS. So something I didn't know, so they have a pretty good sense of smell. Yeah. The gland yeah. in their brain, of course, in the brain <laughs> that controls smell are pretty developed in these birds. Okay. And they'll fly over this ocean to you and I, it just looks like open ocean, but they, can smell. but they can sense where the upwelling of the cold current is, where it out, and then they can smell squid. Squid, like um, twelve miles away. Yeah, it just this is what I mean. We we all of these animals, we just know a fraction. We know this this much, and it's, and and we know that a lot of birds recognize star patterns to get direction yeah. and things, and like pigeons know what angle the sun is supposed to be in the sky, at what point of time it is. They don't have a watch, but they know what time it is. And they use those kinds of clues. And they find the food and they find their nest, or you know, for some of the ones that nest in burrows, they find those by smell. I'm gonna show off what my knowledge of migration, the latest theories is from Scott Wiesenthal's book, Quantum Entanglement. <laughs> if you read Ed Young's, I have no idea. If you read Ed Young's book, I yeah, I haven't read it all. I've read that, that yeah. details all kinds of yeah. incredible really information cool about what animals can do that yeah. we can't, and that's what I think we can't do. We're just scratching the surface. Yeah, you know, it's really pretty slick stuff. All right, well, thanks you guys so much wow. for your.